Hey guys, uh, and those of you online, this is Greg, one of the uh, merch staff here at uh, SickKids. And today we're going to talk a little bit about airway ultrasound. So we just finished reviewing some chapters before we started the screencast that are on airway. So they stole some of the thunder of this presentation. Um, but we're going to try and uh, make up for that by talking about a few other things too. So airway ultrasound. So what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about, first of all, intubation related ultrasound. And we're talking about uh, after that, some surgical airway stuff as well. Um, but the primary thrust is going to be around some of the, you know, sort of more up-to-date stuff that we know about um, uh, ultrasounding around the time of intubation. So when you intubate somebody, and this is not um, stuff specific to POCUS, obviously, um, usually you've got two kind of major questions you're asking about that intubation. First of all, did you get it where you thought it was supposed to go into the trachea? Um, and then second of all, is it optimally placed within the trachea? And as you see, as you'll see, I hope, um, POCUS can answer these questions probably better than our traditional modalities at the bedside. Obviously doing a chest x-ray and all that kind of stuff can really give you a lot of information. Um, but we're really concerned with, can we at the bedside tell in a patient that, you know, might be acutely unwell, whether we've, uh, optimized those things in a sort of earlier capacity. Um, and, and why does that matter? Well, when we've done studies, uh, so Harvard, of course, has this um, big old uh, video room where they look at all their, tr their, their, their sort of acute care um, uh, management, and uh, they've done a number of studies where they look at uh, different sort of outcomes related to that. And this was a, a large study involving 130 patients where they looked at video review of RSI attempts. And concerningly, they found that in about 19% of those RSIs, um, there was an esophageal intubation. So obviously, that's a one in five, roughly, uh, kids that are getting intubated esophageally. Um, and then um, more than that, main stem intubations are quite common. We know that kids have relatively smaller uh, airways. And so, you know, people who may be used to pushing down a tube quite a bit of ways with, with adult patients obviously need to push a little bit less far. Um, and that can be something that's, uh, you know, sort of a not surprising outcome in the end of it, that 34% of patients are, are main stem intubated. And usually I'm assuming most of these are discovered through, uh, you know, something like a chest x-ray that's done. But can we find out earlier um, that these sorts of uh, issues are occurring? Um, amongst the, um, uh, the two things here, there are some methods we're going to talk about uh, that can actually tell us both of those things in a pretty rapid fashion with ultrasound. So we'll sort of go through a little bit of uh, cases here to try to guide what we, our questions would be. So the first case is a five-year-old kid that's uh, hit by a car. Um, depressed GCS at the scene and intubated by EMS on route. You know, they're driving really fast and these guys are working really hard. And so they've, they've got the tube in place, they think. So once they get to the ED, unfortunately, this kid's looking, you know, basically um, an extremist. So has no palpable heart rates and they're bagging and doing compressions at the same time. And so you're now, you know, being thrust into managing this patient. And your first question is going to be what? Right. The tube is in place. Airway, right. So, you know, this is a arrested patient, essentially, from a trauma. So you're talking about H's and T's really quickly because this could very, you know, rapidly escalate into a case of, uh, you know, calling, uh, calling a death. Um, and so the first question is, where is that tube? And so traditionally, we had a few ways of sort of trying to confirm an ETT. In this case, you could argue certainly for just pulling the tube and bagging and that sort of stuff. And there's probably <clears throat> a very good argument to be made there. Um, but these would sort of be our, our traditional ways of saying, oh, like, are we sure that a tube's in place or not? So direct visualization, auscultation, chest rise, these are notoriously unreliable. So um, I can't give you the exact numbers, but, you know, you're talking about somewhere in sensitivity and specificity ranges in the 50s to 70% kind of range, um, where we know that auscultating um, a tube can often be misleading. So you can often hear air that's going into a stomach or elsewhere um, and assume that that's lung sounds. We know that it's just hard to hear air entry. And so sometimes it might be in place and then you're, you're saying, I don't hear anything. So you're pulling a, a tube unnecessarily. <clears throat> similar for chest rise. These are signs that are just not as easy as we like to assume to see. End tidal CO2 is good as a rule, like we like end tidal CO2 waveforms, they can tell us a lot of information. Um, there is a certain amount of delay there in terms of like having to apply that 
that um, tool. And then, of course, it is unreliable in certain scenarios. Where would be kind of most unreliable? In this exact scenario, right? So we don't actually necessarily expect to get CO2 um, back in the setting of a patient that is uh, actually um, not breathing spontaneously and has no hemodynamic um, uh, kind of flow. So chest x-ray, obviously that's late. So that's not something you should really ever rely on telling you whether a tube's in place or not, um, unless you've previously had a tube in place and you're trying to, you know, check it on your PICU daily rounds. Um, and then fiber optics, I say impractical, like doing things like a C-arm and a glide scope are, you know, there's a lot of good there, but there's also a lot of, you know, the practical reality is people aren't necessarily very familiar with those motion machines. They're not necessarily immediately available to you. Um, and so it can be something where, well, yes, it's very helpful at telling us that the tube's in the right place um, and can be very helpful, at, you know, showing the team that you're putting a tube into the right place. It's just not as easy as saying, yes, get the fight, you know, get the C arm or get the glide scope in most cases. There's a lot of um, potential delays there. So POCUS, well, um, there's been some pretty good studies done in the last few years uh, looking at the ability of POCUS to tell us whether a tube is esophageal versus tracheal. And that's really a binary question, which is kind of one of the most idealized versions of a, a POCUS question. Many of our questions are becoming more and more nuanced, but this one is pretty darn straightforward. Is it in the esophagus? or is it in the trachea? And so um, the big pros of doing POCUS uh, are the high levels of sensitivity and specificity, which you won't find with the things previously mentioned. So sensitivity has been measured up to about 98%. You wonder about the 2% that are missing and what might have happened there exactly, but um, the specificity is 96 to 98%. It's been shown to be done in as little as nine seconds. And of course, it doesn't matter how much noise is going on or whether the patient has any um, you know, circulation at the time of their assessment, you're still going to be able to tell these things because you're looking at a physical sign um, rather than something like end tidal CO2, which, which relies on you know, a certain amount of the patient's hemodynamics being intact. The con really is the sort of understandable one. You need someone that's physically going to be dedicated to doing that job, as well as a machine that's readily available, which, you know, these things are becoming less and less of issues as people become comfortable with doing POCUS. Um, and of course, the machines getting smaller will only make this an easier thing to do. Um, technique wise, it's pretty straightforward. Transverse approach just above the um, sort of thoracic inlet there, with a little bit of pressure over the neck. Um, and usually you're going to bring in the structures into place that sort of look like this. So this is your classic anatomy view, and this is a lot of what we're going to see during a intubation. The big difference, of course, is that, you know, when you look at an anatomy textbook, air looks like, you know, just part of the body, whereas for us, air is something that we can't see beyond. So the trachea is going to show a lot of uh, shadowing down behind it, uh, but you will see all these structures. You'll see a thymus, you'll see, you know, an esophagus that's kind of peeking out from behind, and you'll see these vessels that are kind of coming out um, on the sides of the, uh, of the tracheal structures. So this is like a very, very basic kind of view of what you're going to see. So in the midline here, you see the trachea, with um, a shadowing down or sort of an A-line kind of artifact beneath it. And we were talking a little bit during our chapter review this morning about the different appearances of the trachea and whether it's intubated or whether it's not intubated and how the shadowing changes and the reverberation artifacts. I'll be honest with you, there's, there's a lot of, um, uh, I think a lot of confusion there because I think a lot of it depends on what's happening. Like, do you have an, you know, a, uh, an endotracheal tube that's sitting right adjacent to the trachea? Do you have an inflated cuff there? Um, is the endotracheal tube not even touching the trachea? All these things are going to change a little bit of how the trachea actually looks under the ultrasound probe. And to be honest with you, I don't actually think it matters too much. What you're really looking for is A, is it in the esophagus? And B, we can talk about, you know, it, whether it's optimized in terms of position, but there are definitely better techniques than looking at um, the, the sort of appearance of the trachea as it relates to the sort of uh, reverberation artifacts um, underlying it. And we'll get to some of those in this presentation. Um, but in short, in this, this appearance here, if someone was actually, you know, sitting there with a tube in their mouth, you would assume that it's within their trachea because of the, the lack of seeing a tube in the esophagus.